to be honest it it's all a blur uh i just felt tired uh now peru does have an mtc and so a lot of people don't know that uh, if they still do it now i don't know if they do but we only spent about four weeks in the provo mtc and then they shipped us off to lima to the peru mtc for about six weeks and so all that happened in a longer period of time between arriving getting accustomed to peru peruvian food uh and all of that jazz so first arriving uh, to be honest i got i got sick um i got sick right before we left to peru and so the plane ride was not very good for me um i i arrived to peru sick and then uh, when we got to the mtc i felt a little better but um it's probably just nerves and being tired and you know getting used to the climate but um I got so sick that uh, the Peru MTC's president had to give me a blessing, um, and that was an interesting experience. But um, it, when you arrive in Peru, just relax and take it all in. I think don't really don't don't try to focus on the language. Don't don't try to focus on anything. Just go with the flow, and I think it, it'll just naturally come to you if you have faith that um, the language will come to you assuming that you're putting your part in um, it'll come it'll come and so uh, the peru mtc was a great experience um, just again to get to the accustomed to the culture and the language and and all of that jazz and then it just seemed like a blur when we woke up that morning and they shipped us off to the the mission office we met our um, our president, and uh, he said, "Let's go to work." And we met our companions, and then <laughs> we walked outside, took a taxi, and went straight to the to our little apartment there. And uh, <laughs> literally, like I didn't even unpack. We had a meeting we had to get to with a um, with an investigator, and um, I remember showing up in this little like adobe house like going from within 24 hours going from a really nice mtc with all you can eat whatever food and commodities you can have to this adobe hut and with like two chairs and dirt floors and it was just i really have no idea what i was thinking like like this is just a culture shock so between not really understanding the language, the culture shock, and me being extremely tired, it was just all a blur. In fact, I remember coming home that night, um, my companion wanted me to offer the, the prayer before we got into bed, and um, I remember saying the prayer, and midway through, I just took a pause to think about what I was going to say, and next thing I know, my companion nudges me and was like, Elder, I fell asleep in the prayer. Like saying the prayer, I fell asleep. I was so tired. And I was like, oh, finished the prayer and then went to bed and and the rest is history. So I was kind of, that's kind of it, that experience there. Peru has grown as far as member wise, just, just tremendously. In fact, when I was there, there was only one temple. Um, it was just the Lima temple, uh, which is right next to the MTC, which was nice. But, um, and now there's, I believe, three or four temples oh that's bad i don't know but it's just grown and and i could tell that just you know fresh getting into the mission it was just like it seems every day we would either run into people or had appointments to go to it's just uh, that's how we proselyted is just walked up to random people or knocked on the doors and said hey would you like to come in there's such a religious religious country to begin with most of them are, are are Catholic, and so that was a great great way to meet people. Like, hey, we want to share a message about Jesus Christ, and they were like, yeah, come on in. And so, just to have that feeling of of being welcomed, um, I think really settled things down for me. I wasn't really sure what to expect, and so, um, but the the Lima South Mission in particular, there's there's so many things. Um, 
There's the there's Nazca. That's all the way the southern part of our mission. I believe it hits the northern part of Chile, if I'm not mistaken. And so um, uh, Nazca is the it goes all the way up till the central of part of Lima, so to speak. And then there's Ayacucho, which is kind of more inward into the country, which which uh, borders the Lima East, like the Cusco type mission. So, um, and uh, the interesting part is in one day you could be on the beach and another day you could be in the mountains skiing within 24 hours. Um, if you ever get sent to Ayacucho, it's a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Nazca feels like you are literally living on the surface of the sun. In fact, I got a nickname, uh, they called me Elder Camarón, <laughs> as Elder Lobster, because I was beat red 24-7, 24-7. In fact, uh, uh, one area, I had to get permission to wear this, but it was like this, this big, huge circled hat that shaded me. Uh, the first time I got burnt, um, the very first area, because it was so sandy, the sun would just reflect off the sand and just double burn me. Um, they, the, the pensionista is is the kind of the a sister that's a member of the ward that uh, volunteers to cook for the missionaries every meal. So that's something different. You probably know about that, but um, and so. She, when I got home, she's like, Elder, we gotta fix you up. So she cut, is it aloe vera? Al aloe vera, that plant that grows and slapped it on the back of my neck. And oh, that was the best feeling in the world. So if you ever get sent to Nazca, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but it's a great area, don't get me wrong, just temperature. I'm kind of particular about temperature. So, but Ayacucho on the other hand, it's, uh, it's beautiful. You can be outside and the sun not burn you. That is a miracle. So, um, and there's tons of places to go in Ayacucho. In fact, it seems like every, every P-Day we went to a different place. There's monuments, there's waterfalls, there's hikes, there's uh, tons of things to do. Um, and then there's Lima. Lima is really interesting because um, uh, when somebody says they're from Lima, you got to be way more specific because there's different districts they're called within Lima. And so um, uh, we can come back to this later, but I, I wasn't a problem elder, but I had more crazy changes than I did regular changes on the mission. So I got to know Lima very well. Um, so I started kind of at the southern tip of Lima Via Salvador, that's where all the sand and houses like that are. Um, and then I moved into the, you know, in into the, the better part, better part of Lima. It seems like the more centralized you go into Lima, the better things are. The that's where the money is, is the central part of Lima. So, if you go on the very, very outskirts of Lima, that's that's where I was. Now, keep in mind that the church is fairly young in this country even though it's growing at a rapid rate it's still really young some bishops and branch presidents mean well but they don't they sometimes don't mean to do things and so um in this particular case the circle bishop um he when we shut up he was just I don't know, it, it, he was getting thing. he was making sure that things were done that didn't really matter and it was kind of taking away from the spirit of things. And so when we met with the bishopric for whatever that, whatever that morning meeting is, um, uh, we kind of brought that up to his attention and, and, and how, like in our wards in the United States, this is kind of how we handled it. And, and, uh, and that was my companion and the bishop just straight up turned to me and asked well how do you treat an elder like he was such a humble man to to understand truly how things should work and and principles and 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 things like that so i think it had something to do with the sacrament or something like that but um and so we were able to 
to teach him and and he really helped uh, help the ward grow and the attendance in the ward the, the things with with wards in in Peru it's really kind of interesting the wards are huge I mean we're talking I would say maybe 2,000 members in a single ward however the activity rate is very very small uh, whether it be the reason of them just straight up not going or they moved or died or is their record keeping there isn't the best again this was 10 years ago so I'm sure it's changed but um, and so when we showed up at a ward um, one thing that I like to do and I got this idea from from another elder is to print out uh, a ward directory and just try to visit every single house on the ward directory and that was an easy way to meet people um like one time we knocked on the door and said hey is this guy here and they're like oh he died like six years ago so we were able to update it and also meet whoever was at that house again and we were able to uh, share the message and and it was just an easy way of of meeting new people so uh activity is fairly low but there's tons of, of uh, members in Peru, and um, I mean, hence the, the temples that are going up like, like crazy in, in Peru. I mean, there's, there's branches that, that are made up of, geez, I don't know, 10, 15 people at times. You know, the further out you go, the, the smaller they get, it seems. Um, one thing that was very powerful that didn't really click in my head uh, until later in the mission whether it was to teach uh, lessons with members uh, present and so uh, what I would try to do is whenever we'd have a, a, a lesson with an investigator uh, I would choose the closest semi-active member that I could find to that house and say hey we're actually just teaching this guy around the corner from your house do you want to you want to come join us and and uh, even the most simple testimony, they're like, well, you know, I, I don't know all the stuff that you know. Why do you need me? Well, I just need your testimony. And sometimes you could get some really spiritual experiences. You could just feel it in the room. Like it was sometime, one time I had it silent for a good four minutes. And that was the longest four minutes of my life. But we just soaked it in. And so I would say from the get-go, try to get as many members as you can involved with, with the, uh, the lessons that you teach to investigators. Um, as far as the content is concerned, um, I would say keep it as simple as possible. I tend to elaborate more than I should. And uh, missionaries, now this is a general, general statement, but most, a lot of missionaries get fairly confident around the 9 to 12 month mark to the point where they use scriptures more than they should meaning I don't want to call it Bible bashing but they start to do stuff that they shouldn't do I guess and so try to keep things simple like with testimonies sticking to the lessons uh, using members and just share the message i guess and have a lot of patience um in peru they have a i mean there's this thing called conviviente i'm sure that's pretty common in south america but it's like a whatever that common law if you live with somebody for so many years you're practically married quote unquote and so teaching people the law of chastity is is fairly hard especially when somebody wants to get married but you can't because they were born in some tiny little town that takes days and a lot of money to get to to get your birth certificate from the municipalidad in order to get married. And if they can't do that, they can't get married. And if they can't get married, then they can't get baptized. So sometimes that happens. Um, I had a lady that felt so strong about it. She found the money somehow and took like the 48 hour bus ride to her little town, got her birth certificate, came back and got married and then got baptized. So the law of chastity I think is, is pretty big down there. So I served in 
uh, from 05, from November of 05 to uh, November of 07. And I served in so many places. There was Villa Salvador, um, uh, Chincha twice, uh, Villa Salvador twice. Um, s there was Le like Lima Tambo. There was San Juan de Middle Flores. There was um, Circo. Um, I served in pretty, oh, in Ayacucho. I served in almost every area minus Nazca. Thank goodness, because I know Nazca was really, really, um, really, really hot. So Chincha, uh, again, yeah, I lived there about 10 years ago, but Chincha um, is a really easy going place. <laughs> so easy going. If you try to keep schedule at all, pretty much anywhere on the mission, you're, you're gonna go crazy. Um, you'll never be on time anywhere. Um, but uh, uh, essentially the way to get around, especially in Chincha is uh, motos. It's a little, it's, it's like a little little hut, a uh, motorcycle with a little hut on it. And uh, you just, it's like hailing a taxi. You just put your hand up and there's a million of these things. Like, there's no way you can't find one. You can just say taxi or whatever and one will pull up and uh, you bargain your price of where you want to go. Now in Chincha, assuming that you're not going out in, Timbuktu, the outskirts of Chincha, you can pretty much get anywhere with one soul, um, which is hardly anything at all. You could probably get anywhere with, with 50 cents. But um, uh, but yeah, that's how you get around. If you're really in a hurry, you just hail one and then get to where you want to go within 30 seconds or whatever. They go really fast and they drive very crazy. Um, but uh, every city is essentially based or centered around a plaza. It's really neat. Um, it's almost like a really, really, really small central park. It's like just with pathways and benches and cool palm trees and stuff like that. Um, and Chinch is known for <laughs> a couple of things. Uh, number one is um, uh, way back when they used to import slaves into Chincha. And so uh, there's a lot of ethnicity within Chincha, um, you know, slavery type history. And so uh, that was really interesting. And then it's, uh, you know, right on the beach, right beach, beach there, so it's really humid. But uh, a lot of a lot of places like Ayacucho you can go. I mean, there's um, trails, uh, monuments, that sort of thing. And um, at least back then, the <laughs> I took out my money for the month and uh, I got a fake 100 soul bill out of the ATM, but I didn't know that at the time until I had left Chincha, tried to pay my rent with it, and they came back and said, yeah, this is fake. I'm like, I got it from the ATM. So there's lots of fake money there, especially in Chincha, I think. So you got to be careful about where you get your money and how you get it and stuff like that. Um, Never carry more than maybe a couple souls. Like in your, they've got little pouches you can stick on your belt or maybe just stick them in your scriptures or something like that. But never, ever carry more than that because uh, I've been robbed a couple times and uh, nothing really too serious. But oh, the, well, the housing, it's, you know, Adobe housing. Um, the other thing that it's known for. I don't know if you want to put this in, but uh, one thing that's really, really, really known for is eating cats. It was a very, very sad, sad time. Um, so I guess to preface that, um, so the epicenter was in Pisco and I was in Chincha at the time and Chincha, it, it's like a stone's throw away from Pisco. So, I mean, we were really, really close to the epicenter and that was, yeah, that was really bad. But even the people in Lima, now Chincha and Pisco are 
really, really far away. I forgot how long of a bus ride it is, but even the people in Lima felt it. So like there were buildings shaking, even in Lima. So that just kind of tells you how, how bad it was. But so the week prior, it almost seemed like every morning it became our alarm clock that I think just like a little blurb, like almost like a little rumble woke us up. But it was like almost nothing, like to the point where you just chalk it up like, okay, maybe that's just me or whatever. But then after the fact, it's like, oh yeah, that really did happen. And so uh, that day, w that day was actually pretty busy, a pretty busy day for us because the mission president was coming and I was the zone leader at the time, me and my companion. And so um, uh, we proselyted like we normally would. And um, we went in for our interviews. And um, the sun was just kind of going down. So it was around dinner time, around I think five or six or something like that. And um, uh, we, after the interviews, we actually had a, we had to jet across the, a little, little thing to, to go to, a, um, to an investigator's house and, and ironically teach her about the, the um, law of chastity to get married and all that jazz. And uh, I swear I'm not making this up, okay? And we were, as we were teaching her, I forgot, I, this is bad, I don't remember the scripture, but we were teaching her about not, not um, delay the day of your repentance because Jesus Christ, you know, will, will come again and, and reign on the earth and all that jazz. And right after we finished that, Right after we finished that um, that verse, it started. And uh, I don't know if it was the, the verse or whatever it was, but I, I'm pretty sure I went into shock because I didn't know what was going on. And so it, it was just like we were kind of in Adobe House, like Chin Chin Pisco. It's a very, 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 very poor part of the country. So Adobe housing, you know, mud, all that jazz, but... Like, I just sat there. I, I literally thought it was the second coming. Like, I'm not joking. I really did think that. And so my companion kind of got me out of the, the shock. And we all ran outside. As soon as we got outside, the house fell down. And because we were just a field away from the, the uh, stake center, because that's where the mission present was, you know, we booked it there. Um, and as we were running to the chapel, dogs were howling. You know, the power was out, obviously, because that sort of place, anything like that, and everything's down to the ground. It seemed like the only thing that stayed standing was the chapel, ironically enough. And so um, everybody was down on their knees. Dogs were howling. Like, they were crying out to God. And, uh, I mean, it was freaking me out. Like, I... I my legs were shaking. They would not stop shaking. We showed up at the at the church, made sure all the elders there that were waiting for the interviews that they were okay. But the elders that weren't there, obviously that responsibility fell on our shoulders to make sure that they were okay. So there were two elders that we couldn't get a hold of right away because they were on the kind of the outskirts of the city, and it takes a bit to get there. And you know you couldn't take a moto or a taxi like. Everything was down on the ground. No streets were, you weren't able to go around in the streets except for walking around anymore. And the sisters weren't there. So our first priority was the sisters to make sure that they were okay. It was a trio. And uh, so the mission president and his wife and kids were there. Um, we all walked through the streets of Chincha towards the, um, the sisters' place. The moment we got there, they were safe and sound, thankfully. They were shook up, you know, obviously because of what had happened. And uh, we couldn't get to the other elders. We had no idea what was going on. So we all kind of huddled together at the stake center. We brought everybody back to the stake center. Luckily, the elders that were kind of at the outskirts, they had slowly but surely made their way back. So we knew every missionary was okay. And I don't know how, but the landline in the, in the stake center was okay so the mission president said call your folks tell them you're okay and uh after the after an earthquake like this or pretty much any earthquake you know there's aftershocks 
So every, like, there was constant movement of the ground, and then every so often there was, like, a bigger one. I mean, it was just the ground wouldn't stop shaking. And so when it was my turn to go into the chapel, because we didn't want to be in there, you know, we went in the chapel, and um, I actually had to make two phone calls because my parents were separated, and I had to make sure that both of them knew that I was okay. So I called my dad, and... He knew what was going on, so he's like, you're alive, good, get to work, you know, sort of thing. I love you, thanks for calling. Then I called my mom, and uh, and right at this point, there was a bigger thing that happened, so I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And right when that happened, I was like, I love you, you gotta go, and I hung up on her. Because <laughs> I didn't want to be in the chapel when it, like, like if this thing goes down, I'm, I'm not being in it. So... Thankfully, the mission president let me go back in and call my mom again and be like, okay, sorry, it was just an aftershock. I'm okay. I love you. Bye. And so after everybody did that, uh, two of us, well, we quickly went in there and took the benches out of the chapel uh, because nobody really had a place to sleep. Um, and, uh, and so we, um, we locked up the chapel because most chapels, uh, they're protected by this kind of outer wall with glass shards coming out from the top so that people don't try to get in and like steal stuff. Um, and uh, we, and, and almost every chapel has a little, it's like a little mini soccer field. And uh, so we just put the benches out there and we laid down and well, most of the guys laid down, I didn't. I don't think I slept a wink that night because I was just shaking the entire time. In fact, my body started to get sore so much that I was shaking. Also on a side note, Chincha, um, outside of Chincha, there's one of the biggest, most high priority um, uh, criminals in Peru that they keep there. So like murders, rapists, all that jazz, and all of them had escaped because the walls had come down from the prison. Yeah, I wasn't gonna sleep that night. So um, I might have gotten like 30 minutes of sleep. And uh, after the sun came up, we realized you know, how bad it was. And the mission president said, okay, go make sure that you know, all the members in your ward are okay. You know, help people out, that sort of thing. Because we actually couldn't leave the city because the main highway that connected Lima from where we were at had been destroyed in a specific spot. So we, we couldn't go anywhere. So we just went to all of our investigators, the members. We just literally just walked around and it became a service mission for like three days. Like we went up to one of the, I think it was the, I forgot what this, the, the, ward ward missionary i forget what they're called but like they were trying to rebuild their house and they needed help so we happened to run into them and and help them at least put a roof over their head for that night and we just walked around and helped people and and uh waited for the uh highway to get fixed and then after that they just shipped us to make sure everybody was okay, they shipped everybody that was outside of Lima. So like Nazca, Pisco, Chincha, they shipped everybody to Lima. And so uh, because of that, you know, areas, pretty much everybody became a threesome. And uh, and yeah, that that's kind of, oh, and then, and then Peru kind of put together a little thing for like everybody to come and put together like care packages for the people in the main stadium of Lima, I forgot what it's called, but um, yeah, the missionaries went there and put them all together and then they shipped everything down there. We had a fairly nice house. However, we lived on the third floor and the only way to get there was this rickety old skit staircase. Um, and so after the earthquake, it was still standing but I didn't want to risk it. So obviously when they shipped us out, I mean, I, I could barely bring my luggage up. 
So I, I just straight up, I just threw it off the roof because I'm like, I'm not coming down with my luggage. That's way too much weight. So I just threw it off the thing and then slowly came down the staircase because I was thinking it was going to, you know, fall off or something because it had like, the, the foundation was cracked, everything. At a moment's notice, it could have fallen. But as far as d the deaths, I am i don't remember. Um, I do know there were not very, if any, very many casualties as far as members are concerned. I do remember there was a interesting fact about that. So I just, I just don't remember off the top of my head. Their food is very unique, I guess. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest to have an open mind about the food. Um, I'm one of those people that is very particular about their food. Um, but at the same token, I try everything at least once. Okay? Um, and, and if they still do, if there's a pensionista that cooks the three meals a day for them for the elders every single day um, a lot of them take in consideration that a gringo or a, a guy from the united states is coming into their country and they're not used to the food so uh, a lot of those sisters they do take that into consideration and they try to try to tailor it a little bit as much as they can to help the elder out so that was one thing that I was very, very grateful for. Um, I mean, the Peru MTC really prepped me for a lot of that because they served us pretty much every Peruvian type dish they could dish out at us so that we'd be semi ready. And they're never, if you were truly done, never, ever, ever finish your plate, ever. Okay, I don't know if this is standard in South America, but in Peru, if you have one bite let, left and you're done, do not take that last, last bite because if you take the last bite, they're thinking you're going to want more. Automatically, they'll give you more. And if you're like, oh, sister, I'm done, they will be very offended. They'll be like, oh, you didn't like it? It's like, are you serious? I just finished this whole plate. I am stuffed to the brim. If I eat any more, I will throw up. But no, they will not take it that way. So just a little advice there. Okay. Uh, in Chincha, my favorite foods, uh, 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 I mean, I would say it's favorite food of all time, it is uh Catapucra with sopa seca. So it's essentially, mm, it's potatoes with a bunch of um, little vegetables in it and it's kind of spicy with, not exactly sure how to, sopa seca is like dry, dry noodles. And uh, it, I don't know what it is, but it's from heaven. It's manna. That's essentially what it is. It's so good. Um, but they really only serve it in chincha. Uh, if you get a really cool sister, I don't know how she'll find it, but she'll find it somewhere in, in Lima. And then uh, Milanesa, if, uh, if you just want a safe, safe food, Milanesa is the way to go. It's essentially fried chicken, but they take all the bones out and it's like a, just a piece of, piece of meat, fried meat, and it's really good. Um, and one thing that you should try as you're going home, uh, not on the mission because it's against mission rules, as at least it was at the time, is um, ceviche. Um, it, it was okay for me, but a lot of people really like it. So I'd give it a shot. It's essentially, uh, for those of you who don't know what ceviche is, it's raw fish cooked in, cooked in uh, the lemon acid um, and chicharron. I could live in chicharron. There's chicharron de pescado, chicharron de, de pollo, and chicharron de um, puerco. Like, it's just, again, it's fried stuff. But it's really, really good. <laughs> uh, those would be my favorite. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. gosh. Um, uh, there's this uh, thing called rocoto. Okay. It is not a tomato. Whatever, if you see anything that looks like a tomato, make sure it's a tomato because one of, uh, one of the sisters, she decided she didn't want to cook that day. So she took us out to a little tienda and, uh, and we got chicharron. And with chicharron right in the middle, it's kind of like a big, huge plate. And right in the middle, there's um, rocoto to kind of help spice things up. And they slice it up and it looks exactly like a tomato. Okay, so that day, 
I was just chowing down. I'm like, huh, I wonder what this would taste like with tomato. I'm like, anybody going to eat this slice of tomato? And everybody around me is like, no, we're not going to eat this slice of tomato. And I put the whole slice in my mouth. I took, I barely took a half a bite. Like, and you, I lost complete feeling in my entire face. Face gone. I couldn't talk. It hurt so bad. It is the hottest thing you could ever eat in your entire life. So make sure it's a tomato or a cotto. Okay, just a word of advice there. That's all. <laughs> and milk does not help at all. So I woke up that morning with a stomach ache. And uh, we had a baptism that evening. So we had to get the font ready, you know, fill it up, because it takes a while, like hours and hours and hours. So. We, uh, and then finding a key to the chapel is, is fun. So we first had to find a key and then get in, fill up the font. And this whole time I just had a horrible stomach ache. And I thought it was just something that I ate. And then, uh, so we, we started the font, we left, locked everything up while it was filling up, and then we started proselyting. In fact, we ran into a guy, started teaching him a quick little lesson to, to see if we can come and visit his, at his house, and no joke, while my companion was talking to him, we were just standing there in the middle of the road. I put my hand on his shoulder. I'm like, Elder, keep talking. I'm going to go sit down. Like, I couldn't stand anymore. It was really bad. Um, and so uh, he's like, Elder, are you okay? And and this is my very first um, area, by the way. I was maybe two or three months into the mission. <laughs> and I'm like, I think so. I think it's just something I ate wrong. So can we just like... Can I go take a nap or something? Because I, I cannot function. So we went home. I took something, fell asleep, um, and then we had to wake up and make sure the font was okay. And it was just kind of sore. didn't really hurt. And um, that evening, I was getting ready. I was actually getting dressed, you know, in, in my whites to baptize a, a gentleman. And uh, right when I got ready... I opened up the stall and it just hit me. I fell right to the floor and started hyperventilating. And uh, I lost feeling from my waist down because I was hyperventilating and taking in too much oxygen. I just, I just was in so much pain. The guy that I was supposed to baptize, he, ca he came in because he heard something and uh, he got my companion. And we, uh, they lifted me up, they called a taxi, threw me in the backs of a taxi. And here I am just hyperventilating. <laughs> and, and they're like, yeah, we're taking you to the hospital. We, we don't really know what's wrong. So they rushed to the hospital. And uh, I was kind of more worried about his baptism. I'm like, no, you've got to get baptized, man. Like, come on. But uh, so I remember, see, it's a, kind of a blur, but I remember um, being on a bed, it seems like everything they make is smaller in Peru, including beds, probably because they're a little bit on the shorter side. Um, and so I, I don't, I really don't know why, but so the beds that we slept in anywhere, they were just like my ankles hit the banister. It just was never, or whatever that's called. And it was never big enough, but so I remember getting into the hospital bed and my knees were propped up and uh, then they like took an x-ray and they checked me out and they're like, no, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. But just in case it's appendicitis, just in case, we're going to hold you overnight and see you how you feel in the morning. That was a most horrible night next to the earthquake night ever in Peru because it, it was so hard to sleep with my knees up. You know, your knees get all locked up and stuff like that. But um, so they come in, okay, Elder, how do you feel? I feel horrible. Okay, it's appendicitis. And I'm like, oh no. Like, I really thought I was gonna die. That would be the first time I thought I was gonna die in the mission. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if that's common or not, but multiple times I thought I was gonna die in the mission. So the nurse came in, uh, how do you feel? Um, you know, not very good, you have appendicitis, okay, we need to prep you for surgery. Now anybody who's had surgery before knows, especially guys in that area, 
uh, how they prep people. Uh, so uh, they shaved me down and um, I really didn't know what they were doing because they just pumped me through. They pumped me with so many meds, okay? Um, I really didn't know what was going on. And uh, they laid me down. The doctor came in and said, okay, you ready for the surgery? Um, like in, this is all in Spanish, okay? All in Spanish. And I'm what, two, three months in? I'm A, you know, learning Spanish. B, getting prepped to have appendicitis in a Peruvian hospital. My immediate thought was, I'm going to die. And I said it out loud. I just kept saying, I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Like, I'm going to have my last wish. Like, I'm like, what am I going to think of? I have the last thought in my head before I die. And the doc's like, you know die. And I'm like, oh, I'm totally going to die now. He's like, don't worry. You're not going to die. He puts the mask on me. And I got to like 99. I'm out like a light. Next thing I know, I wake up propped up in bed with maybe eight nurses surrounding my bed. Peruvians have a fascination with with Americans, they call it, but it's I'm, there's a running joke like, well, you're American, so no, you're North American. It's like, okay. So they're just like, ooh, a white boy in bed, like, look at him. <laughs> I'm still pumped full of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still pumped full of, uh, uh meds that that i'm just like what is going on like i totally died like where am i and uh and so the doc came he said yeah everything was okay and and uh and and come to find out that the mission was currently switching from the hospital i was in to a better hospital in lima because this hospital does shady things during surgery <laughs> Come to find out, I'm like, oh great. And uh, just a little aftermath, uh, what the what the doctor had done to sew me up, I swear he just took the closest shoelace he could find and just wove it in, like not normal stitching. And so you know, four weeks or however long it was afterwards to get my stitches out, he he somehow got me distracted and he snipped you know the ends and then he just took one end and yanked it out just yanked it right out like didn't even give me warning and again he got me distracted somehow he just yanked it out and i was like yeah like oh i i really don't know to be honest i anything that's wrong with me now i blame it on that event um yes so that's kind of the experience of my appendicitis. So the pain that I, I had with the appendicitis, it really felt like a stomach ache at first, and then it just, and then it really starts to, I think, centralized. You can feel it go from a broad pain to more of a centralized, like you feel like something just, it's just somebody sticks like a pencil right into your, whichever side your appendix, appendix is. I've got the scar. I really don't know what side it is. So I just shove something right up in there to the point where you just can't handle it anymore. So a lot of elders, it happens to them at night for some particular, excuse me, some particular reason. Um, and they just toss and turn through the pain until they wake up in the morning and then it's bad enough to go to the hospital. It's what's happened nine times out of 10. It's random. And what's really dangerous is if that thing ruptures while it's inside you, you're practically dead. Like, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. So you want to get that thing out as soon as possible. So it was just with the first lesson. I mean, it was a pretty, um, you know, run-of-the-mill lesson, I guess. And, um, and, and we were actually teaching with... Um, with a couple and and the lady that we were kind of looking more towards because uh, the guy the, the guy had actually just gotten baptized just barely and so we were we were talking to his wife because she was kind of hit and miss with her we could never really hammer her down and so we were we were talking with her about the just what we were teaching her husband 
And the first lesson, um, you know, we got to the first vision. And I really have no idea, to be honest, what it was. But it was when the words came out of my mouth, it was... I really can't explain it. Like, like, I don't know if you've ever had that feeling before that you just can't explain. It was one of those feelings that you just knew. <laughs> Shame on you for making me cry. And I, uh, I knew if I, I knew if I kept talking, I wasn't going to be able to hold it together. So maybe that's why I was quiet, but I could barely get through the first vision and then, and then I just stopped. And then we just sat there and she, she was actually looking at, cause we weren't fancy back then. We didn't have iPads, you know, we just had the, the little picture of Joseph Smith looking up. Had Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. She just stared at it. And then, and then, I don't know, one time it passed, I just asked her, like, do you feel that? Like, do you feel what is going on right now? And, uh, you know, investigators don't really understand it when they feel it for the first time or even whenever. And, you know, all of us testified that that was the, that was the spirit, you know, telling her that that was true. And, um, and yeah, I mean, we just kind of wrapped it up from there and left her with that feeling and kept teaching her later. And she ended up getting baptized, which was fantastic. but. It was just, it's sad for, well, for me anyways, it's sad that those moments don't happen very often, as much as you want them to happen very often. Because there's tons of, I don't know what it was, that the stars just aligned and it just happened. Because when you get in a lesson, I mean, there's so many distractions that happen, especially in Peru, because it's such a busy, busy, busy country between kids running around and little motos driving by and the heat just gets to you and I don't know what it was. None of that, none of that mattered. None of that happened. And it was just really, really cool. Pouring down rain. Um, and you won't experience that at all in Peru other than like uh, Ayacucho. So Ayacucho, you you have an umbrella, so, and, and, uh, b boots. No, but there's dogs everywhere in Peru. There's probably more dogs than people in Peru. Kind of talked about this. Don't get caught up in the knowledge. You never teach from knowledge. You teach from the spirit. So that's, yeah, I got wrapped up in it once and my companion sent me in my place and that was that. It has definitely taught me to put in um, everything, into everything that I do. It, uh, I think my work ethic really um, benefited from the mission and because of that I'm where I'm at today. I have a great job and I'm known for my work ethic so it's, um, yeah, I think that, that, that pretty much helped, helped me out. Have patience, do your best, mean well, and everything will work out in the end. I would uh, read the Book of Mormon cover to cover right before you go on a mission and have a firm testimony of it. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Have fun. But not too much fun. <laughs> um, yeah, just date, date around. Um, 
uh, yeah, I would say just don't come home and marry the first gal you encounter. So I, I just know that that can get, especially right your last interview with the president, get home, get married sort of thing, just calm down and have fun. I really don't remember the circumstances, but um, it might have been even in the MTC, I witnessed a sister going up and sharing her testimony and she said she was really embarrassed and it was the bishop's fault. But she ended up saying, I'm pregnant and, the, and it's the bishop's fault because she said it embarazada. You would think that would mean embarrassed in Spanish, but it means pregnant. So um, other than that, I, I don't think I've made, I made sure to not make that mistake. Short sleeves, you'll never wear your suit. I might have worn my suit maybe a half a dozen times for like zone conferences or something. It's just so hot. Um, just only, I would say the list that the mission people gave you to bring was spot on. So whatever they recommend bringing, you could do that. So yeah. You're probably wondering why you got called there or if it was a mistake perhaps, or maybe you're really excited, who knows. But I know, especially after the fact, I know that I was sent there for a particular reason and there was no other mission on the earth that I could have gone to. And that call came directly from Heavenly Father through, through the apostles, through the prophet. And just remember that throughout your two years of experience there. And whenever you get down or, you know, down in the, down in the, down on yourself, just, just remember that and, and know that you're there for a reason, whether you need to find it or not, just, just remember that.